What is your name? My name is Joanna Pendergrass. And what do you play? What instrument? I play the viola. Well, let's let's start back a ways. Um, you have an interesting career, your main professional career. Can you tell us a bit about it? Sure. So I am a freelance medical writer. Um, my focus with medical writing is consumer education. And within that, I focus primarily on pet owner education. So a lot of my clients are websites that produce a lot of pet owner education content. So I write a lot about the basics of pet care and pet health. And the reason why I focus so much in that area is because I am a veterinarian by training. So, and, but I knew that I did not want to go into private practice after vet school. And I learned about medical writing while I was doing a two-year postdoctoral fellowship at Emory. And the research route wasn't working out that well for me. So I decided that I could combine my love of science and love of writing with medical writing. And something that I had learned in vet school, something that our professors really impressed upon us was the importance of speaking to pet owners um, in a very compassionate way and breaking down complex medical topics in a way that they can understand. So that really informs my writing and I'm very passionate about making sure that pet owners understand the pet care information that they need in order to make good health decisions for their pets. Right. How did you move from being a doctor of veterinary medicine to a writer? What, well, were, were they both paths that you were following at the same time? or Because they're both pretty very specialized areas. Yes, so I actually, I don't really see that there's a separation between the two because I see myself as combining those two things. So even though there aren't a lot of veterinarians who are medical writers, because you, most medical writing is in human health writing. So it's a little interesting to come from an animal health background into an area that is more focused on human health. Um, but a lot of the information in animal health is very easily translatable to human health. So it's not as big a separation as someone might think. That's the niche that I wanted to go into so that I could most, um, most put to use the, the academic training that I had in vet school and translate that into writing. So it's really, I, I don't see it as much of a separation as just using my degree in a different way. Right. It's really a communication skill of yeah. your specialization. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you, you classify it as pet, uh, but do you work with large or do you write about large animals also, horses and you know, elephants? Yeah, know. primarily, <laughs> primarily it, it's small animals and within that primarily dogs. Um, so when a lot of the pet owner education writing that is online, at least from what I've seen, is more focused on dogs and cats. Of course, there is you know, a lot that goes into the care of larger animals, especially horses. But for me and for the clients that I have, the prim primary focus is on dogs and cats. And this writing mainly appears in uh, vet, vet uh, websites and, and brochures and instructional material for their clients that they do? So for me, yes, um, with my consumer education writing, a lot of my writing is on websites. So, but there are different ways, of course, that, um, that you could share that information. So yes, you could uh, do brochures um, or different, I guess, other types of, of platforms. But for me, my writing is primarily websites. Gotcha. We know you, I know you, because of your association with the Atlanta Musicians Orchestra. So I consider music to be my first love. I began playing the piano when I was in first grade, and my mother, she actually played the piano um, throughout, I think at least throughout college, and she, she still does play from time to time. So it was really special that when I was taking piano lessons, 
I actually used some of her old books in my lessons. Um, so I played the piano from first grade until my junior year in high school. And I started the viola when I was in third grade. And the reason I chose the viola was because everyone else was choosing the violin. And I wanted to be different. So I started the viola when I was in third grade. And I played that consistently through college. And then when I got to vet school, I played a little bit on and off, but it wasn't very consistent. And when I graduated from vet school and moved down to Atlanta, I still, I wanted to get back into playing in an orchestra, but I couldn't find an orchestra um, that was close by because I soon discovered just how bad the traffic is here. Mm -hmm. And it just didn't seem feasible for me to, to play in an orchestra and I couldn't get to the rehearsals. So I just kind of sat on it for a few years. And then I think it was in 2014, I just, I got this feeling that I, I still want to continue playing. So I just did a Google search again um, for local orchestras and came across the AMO and browsed through the website. And when I noticed that no auditions were required, <laughs> that was what, <laughs> That's what sealed the deal for me because since I hadn't been taking lessons in so long, I was a little bit nervous about my technique and just going through the whole audition process. So to be able to just join an orchestra without having to audition, that was perfect. And how did you feel when you joined the AMO? I was a little nervous mm -hmm. because it had been a while since I played in an orchestra. So just kind of the rhythms of going to orchestra person that I, I, I just felt a little bit out of practice in that so I was a little nervous um I think at least that the first practice that I came to um but after that I just feel like I just kind of fell right back into things um and it felt just completely natural so here you are playing with the AMO and after a couple of years you're now sitting first chair, your principal violist. Um, how does that how does that affect your life, your your music, and and your availability of time? So when I first became principal, it definitely felt like you know an extra responsibility, mm -hmm. um, not just from being able to you know be a leader essentially, but also to make sure that if my section, if they had questions, then they could come to me. So it, it was a different, to me, it felt like a different level of leadership to be in the first chair, uh, first chair position. Um, you know, it's not necessarily about being the strongest player, but it, it is definitely about being a good leader. So um, if anything, it was, it was kind of a mindset shift um, that I'm not just a member of the viola section, I'm now the principal. Um, but it really hasn't been a huge shift, and I think that just speaks to the level of friendliness in our orchestra, that it doesn't, there's not a competitive spirit. So even though, you know, I'm sitting in the first chair position, I still, you know, I'm happy to not just answer questions, but also just consider different suggestions from different members of my section. So it feels more of a collaboration as opposed to I'm first chair and everyone else has to follow me. Right. Um, but I do feel an extra, I won't call it a burden, but definitely a, a task to make sure that I have practiced enough so that as a first chair, I'm not slacking off in being able to play the music. Yeah, exactly. There's that, there's the leadership. There is, you know, the fact that you have to do the Boeings every time you have a new series of yes. pieces. Uh, and people, a lot of people don't realize how much time that takes and how much effort and thought that takes. And um, yeah, it's yes. important. Yeah. But, yeah, so that's that's right. With, with the Boeings, that, that is quite a bit of work. Um, but 
at the same time, I don't mind it because I'd rather do the work on the front end than everyone trying to do it as we go along. And even if you know, we come up with changes, at least we have a baseline to work with at the beginning as opposed to just trying to do it all as we go. And it just becomes fragmented and less efficient. Right, no, it's great. Well, how do you see the changes in the last five or six years that you've, you've been with the AMO? What, what do you see? I, I've seen the group grow stronger. I think that the, the level of playing and the caliber of playing has definitely increased um, in the five or six years that I've been a member. And it's, it, it's been great to see that we can tackle um, you know, harder pieces because the level of, of skill of the members has gone up. And I think it's not just the level of skill, but we see that people are very dedicated to playing and they're dedicated to practicing. It's not just showing up at rehearsals. So I think the fact that, you know, people, the members, have become even more dedicated to the music and to the group and feel more invested in the group. I think that has allowed us to take on that harder music because people are more invested. I agree and I think that one leads to the other because as we get stronger then we do harder pieces and then we get, you know, we're, we're building up our, our musical muscle and, uh, and I, I know yes. sometimes I'll, I'll, I'll put a piece out there for us to start and a lot of moans and groans and and then I get, you know, <laughs> some of those you know, have come from me. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and then I get these comments of, you know, it took me a while, but I really like this piece and it's not as hard as I thought. Yeah. There's a part though that I heard on an inter another interview you did about overcoming a fear of yeah. during that honeymoon. And you could tell us about it. <laughs> yes. So I have a fear of open water, um, not knowing what is below the surface. Like I just imagine there's some huge like sea, mo sea monster um, that's just going to come in and take me away. Um, so I've, I've had a fear of open water for a while. Um, so when Carl and I, when we got to our honeymoon resort, one of the first things that we did, it was his suggestion to go out on this little like, catamaran um, and go out in the water. <laughs> and we ended up going out a little bit further mm -hmm. than we expected. And I was nervous and stressed the whole time. Mm -hmm. And I said, I'm not doing that ever again. <laughs> so it was just because it was open water and I was you know, we were right near the surface of the water. So it was just like panic mode for me the entire time we were out there. So I couldn't wait so, um, until we got back to shore. But did that help you overcome your fear somewhat? No, <laughs> it didn't. <laughs> it just, it just terrified me. So <laughs> I was hoping for that. I still have the fear. <laughs> no, there, there's no lesson learned in that one. I, I'm, I still have a fear of open water. <laughs> we probably won't do any concerts on cruise ships, okay? And you said that um, very early on, you said that uh, music was your, your first love or true love. Um, but uh, we know Carl, your husband, very well. He's a fantastic and really wonderful person. Why don't you tell us a little bit about about what he does and who he is. So Carl, um, he is a medical science liaison with Merck Pharmaceuticals. And he got his PhD in physiology and pharmacology from Wake Forest. And he did his uh, postdoctoral research at Emory, and I think it was in cardiovascular stem cells. So after he completed his postdoc, um, a couple of months after we got married, he was able to begin working at Merck. Um, so in his job, he essentially goes out and speaks with different doctors um, at some of the major hospitals in the area, especially Emory, 
and he is essentially the scientific arm of Merck. So he's not a salesperson, so he's not, you know, selling, selling Merck's products, but he is talking with the doctors about, you know, their, their practices, their patients, um, recent research that has come out. So his focus is in diabetes and heart disease. So he speaks with, with the doctors about recent research that has come out of, you know, in those areas. So that's what he does, and he loves it. <laughs> oh, that's lovely. And yeah, as you know, we all love him dearly. He's, he's wonderful. He comes to all your concerts, and you know, we repeat the concert. He comes to the second concert. It's just a real pleasure to see that support and, uh, and that enthusiasm and that love for you and, and support of us, too. So let me ask you, um, what's your favorite sound? Wow, my favorite sound. It's hard to narrow it down to just one. I think my two favorite sounds are the sound of waves and birds chirping. So I think it's just there, there's something very calming and I think the repetitiveness of both, I think it is very soothing. And just the, the fact that, you know, their nature sounds, I feel like listening to them is a way for me to connect with nature. And it just, it helps to calm my spirit. What's your least favorite sound? My least favorite sound is nails, nails on a chalkboard. <laughs> Just gives me chills. <laughs> uh, well, I don't know if you've seen the other interviews, but um, if uh, when, so when you get up to the pearly gates and um, you see St. Peter, what would you like to hear at that point? I'd like to hear job well done that you you lived out your purpose 